Good morning in this uh, plenary session. Um, you see on the screen what the session is about, about the long-term research challenges in wind energy. That is a document made up by the European Academy of Wind Energy. But now we have the first time a discussion between academics and uh, industry. Uh, I will introduce the people in the, at the table for you. Um, my own name is uh, Gijs van Kuyk from TU Delft, but I have a very limited role. My only role is to have all the arguments passing before it's 10 o'clock. But uh, the people that are really important you see here at the screen and at the table, from my right hand side, and I make this curve, it is Dr. Jens Madsen. He is now at Suslon Blade Site Center. But at the moment we asked him to join this discussion, he was heading the research department of Vattenfall. So he will also bring um, arguments on behalf of an operator into the discussion. Then we have Dr. James Morgan of GE Global Research. Uh, not so long ago, he was responsible for uh, the services in wind energy in, within global research of General Electric. And then we have uh, Matthias Schubert, Wincon Consultants. Matthias is now uh, on its own, but before that he was CTO of uh, Senvion Repower, and before that had a long career in Aerodin, the German design and consulting company. Um, then we have the two wind energy professors, uh, Po Wen Cheng, which I know very well, he came out of our own group, now professor in Stuttgart. And next to that we have uh, James Manuel, although we use the word uh, Jim, Jim Manuel, uh, of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, that is the university in uh, the US with the longest history, at least in education. And he's the driving force behind the North American Wind Energy Academy. As the wind energy community is very informal, we decided to use the first names, all of us, so we forget about titles, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So don't be uh, offended when we do that. Um, so what are we going to talk about, about this document, uh, three years of discussion within the academy. We did it by purpose only with academy members and some people uh, around that, but by academics. By purpose, we did not discuss it yet with industry because we wanted to make up our own mind. That has resulted in a free downloadable um, paper. You can see it on the left-hand side. If you don't have it yet, write down the uh, web page and download it. It's the, in the first issue of our new journal. But as of this week, it is available as a book. Same content, but improved with a lot of nice pictures. So, what is the challenge to discuss? Uh, does the academy research agenda reflect the needs from industry? That is in fact one of the main questions that uh, should be discussed uh, today. Uh, if you zoom in a little bit, uh, the other question is, which long-term research can remove barriers in wind energy development? Because that was exactly the question we posed ourselves. Um, I formulated it sometimes, I like to hear the debate on challenges, that keep us scientists awake during some nights that you think about things to solve. So not the short-term things that we have to do and which are very valuable to do for European Commission proposals. We forget about deadlines, key performance indicators, but the scientific challenges that sometimes drive us uh, mad and sometimes make us very happy. That's the one we like to discuss. Um, to, order, to arrange the discussion a little bit, we have uh, prepared some uh, grand challenges question, if you like, and we will display it on the screen. There are four of these questions that we'll uh, discuss between us. Uh, the first to, end, to give their opinion is the industry forum, and then we ask the academics to comment on that and give their own opinion. Um, there will be a role for the pub public, so for you, but we'll put that at the end of the hour, so uh, the last 50, 20 to 15 uh, minutes. So if you have questions, please make a little note that you still know the question when it is a quarter to uh, 10 o'clock. All right, I've said enough. We go to the very first question, that is this one. And this, in fact, connects nicely to the presentation of uh, 
uh, Bob Crasher yesterday, because we came from far. We did, yesterday we saw a first attempt to build huge machines that was not uh, commercially uh, successful. Now we are able to do so. We built the largest rotating machines on Earth. We built wind power stations with the same size of coal and nuclear power stations. So why do we still need long-term research? That is what many people say. Well, you can do the job, so be, uh, be glad with your success. Do we still need long-term research? Are we right to having started this discussion? So that's the first thing to discuss, and I would like to give the floor to my uh, industry colleagues here. Who likes to take the okay. I, I would be happy to comment first. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I very much appreciate the chance to be here. Not quite sure whether I'm on the industry side or the research side, because I do research for industry. So I guess that's kind of in between. But the nice thing about the position that I have is um, I do aerodynamic and combustion and heat transfer and mechanical design research for the aerothermal and uh, mechanical systems division at GE's research center. So we support not only the wind turbine business, but also power generation, uh, aircraft engines, oil and gas equipment, the, br the broad spectrum. And I think one thing that, that we've seen over the years, it's been more than 100 years now, is just continued progress in technology. So you ask the question, do we still need to do research and development? And I would answer, absolutely, because that's how we've gotten as far as we've gotten today. And take, for instance, combined cycle power plants. Um, you know, it used to be that an efficiency of 40% was seen to be unachievable, and then 40% was achieved, and then 50% was unachievable, and then 60%, and now we've just certified a power plant at 62.22%, which is a world record efficiency. And, and, and that could not have been achieved without constant research and development. And it's the same in the wind turbine industry, as you point out. And so, ab absolutely, that's, how, that's what's gotten us where we are today, and it's gonna take us into the future as well. Yeah, I mean, I can add to that. I mean, um, I think um, there is a, a sort of a food chain, I mean, from uh, basic research, research to the more applied research that goes on in, in industry that I've also, you know, been part of. I mean, um, so uh, the, the progress that we've made, and it is indeed uh, quite, uh, quite impressive in the, in the wind energy community, is uh, something that we couldn't achieve, have achieved without uh, research. I mean, I think... Uh, you look at it here in terms of the, the scale of uh, machines that we built and the scale of maybe of operations in general. I think another way to look at it is uh, to, to look, of course, at the cost that we've driven down. I mean, uh, onshore, I mean, uh, wind is today in many markets uh, probably one of the, yeah, probably in some markets it is the cheapest uh, new generation capacity you can install. I mean, and, and if you look offshore, I mean, I don't know, uh, quite recently here, uh, uh, Danish nearshore, offshore uh, wind farms were awarded at a price of, in an auction of uh, 6.4 euro cents per kilowatt hour. And, uh, and earlier uh, this year, I mean, in Borsali in the Netherlands was, I think, 7.3 yep. euro cents. Uh, Horns Rev was about 10. It's a little difficult to compare. But just go back four or five years, we were talking uh, more than 14, 15 yeah, euro what, cents. What is, <laughs> what is the role of long-term research in coming to the seven euro cents of Bosle? And maybe you can answer that, uh, Matthias. Yeah, I, th I think uh, if we summarize the, the success of this industry in the past 30 years, I think it is based to a large extent on larger size, as you are stating here in your introduction statement, on larger scale, on making wind an industry, also on eliminating white spots on the white grounds of wind engineering, which was a major task in the last, and on sound, proper, robust, and efficient design. But I think this success is at least, if we look back, uh, less based on major game-changing innovation. And, and there we, and in my opinion, we see um, a change of paradigm in the industry that uh, most OEMs today are seeing research, also long-term research, as a strategic topic and have started res respective programs. Why is that? Because uh, the, cost, the reduction of cost of energy, which we have seen in the past, is flattening out if we don't do a change. Um, <clears throat> we have a huge pressure still in the industry from politics and changing subsidy schemes from 
um, uh, a consolidating market, but also from PV, which was mentioned earlier, so there's price pressure coming also from other sources of renewable energies. And therefore, this industry, in my opinion, desperately needs a jump, uh, a major acceleration. Um, and a major acceleration can only come from innovation. One challenge of this industry is that uh, it has not yet developed a large um, research culture, long-term fundamental um, research culture. So what are the right questions? What, are, uh, what is the direction where we want to target our curiosity? And in that respect, I think the paper of the academic Academy is maybe not the one which started this discussion, but it's very helpful to structure this discussion yes, yes. Yeah. in what way do we have to go for fundamental research. Yes. <clears throat> when, what do you think? <laughs> um, that's, of course, a very difficult question, because, but from my view, uh, I, I sat through the industry, and now I'm, I'm on the other side of the table. I, I see this a little bit like uh, a child development, and uh, as uh, you know, we heard yesterday from the presentation from uh, Bob Threshold that you know the industry started with uh, this can-do mentality, yeah. and uh, this is just like I have a kid, and I know they think they can do everything, and it's much more fun to do very risky things <laughs> because when you are small, you evaluate the risk very differently when when you are mature. And I think this is where the industry is heading. We are getting um, a mature industry. We are no longer a small player. We are no longer those little guys say, hey, we are the, those uh, good guys that are going to change the world for uh, better. We are now the big guys. And uh, a big guy don't get much sympathy from, uh, from the population. And this is also one of the points, I think, that uh, when, you, when the industry grows up, just like the kids, you have to take more responsibility. Um, if you have a family, you take responsibility for your family. Now we take responsibility of providing a reliable energy supply. Electricity is just like something like probably after air and water that you miss the most when you don't have it. When we turn off the electricity now, the first thing you say, oh, what I'm going to charge, where I'm going to charge my iPhone and uh, all this kind of thing. So uh, the public opinion is with wind energy, as long as we deliver on the promise of getting clean and, uh, 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 let's say, cheap in a, in a way, because they, uh, the public acceptance is, in a way, shaping the development of the wind technology. It's just like yesterday you say about the two-bladed and versus the three-bladed machine. So I think, uh, in that sense, we are growing in that right direction, but we need to really think about long term yeah. as we grow. Yeah. Yeah. Jim. <clears throat> uh, well, thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, uh, inviting me here. Uh, I have to say, uh, uh, the uh, North American Wind Energy Association is uh, still uh, relatively young and uh, not as uh, big and impressive as uh, the European is, so hopefully uh, at some point, maybe we'll uh, f set up the uh, North Atlantic uh, Wind Energy Association, they have one, one big group, I don't know. But uh, in, in terms of, uh, of where we're going, uh, I certainly uh, was inspired, or uh, I, I also remembered uh, uh, the past uh, when Bob Thresher gave, gave his, his talk last night and, and see how far we've, we've come from those days. But, uh, but what I, I, I think that that what I've been considering recently is 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 the potential role that uh, wind energy has in the future, um, uh, within the context of, of climate change, which uh, certainly, uh, by all uh, appearances, is going to have a pretty major effect. And uh, one of the few ways we have of dealing with uh, the climate change is is wind energy, as well as as well as solar. I think that I think that. Uh, the results of the last few years show that those are going to be the top two, and uh, that means that, that what we do uh, in the future uh, for wind energy research really has to be viewed in, in the context of, uh, of, uh, of being able to provide a very large fraction of the, the world's energy supply, and that means we have to think about uh, not just the design of the turbines, which are certainly getting larger, uh, but the wind plants, which are 
um, are getting larger, but even, even beyond that, when we're talking those scales of energy, uh, those high penetrations and the issues of, uh, of load management, uh, storage, uh, effect on, uh, on, on the environment, uh, either good or bad, all, all have to be considered in, in ways that are uh, more uh, deliberate than perhaps they have been so uh, uh, in the past. Um, certainly, uh, nobody did too many environmental studies back uh, uh, back in the d days of Iron Bridge, when the uh, when the Industrial Revolution was was starting, but maybe if they had, then things would have turned out different. So, I think that's uh, that's going to be one of the uh, the major challenges going forward is to seeing yeah. how we can integrate uh, wind yeah. in a big way yeah. into the the, gr the energy yeah. supply. Uh, thank you. All this was, of course, the easy question because we all agree that we need long-term research. It will be much more difficult to convince the people that are in charge of uh, spending R&D money or giving away R&D money to do so. And then we have to shrink all these arguments to some one-liners, because that is what I understand. But that's not the topic of uh, today. Uh, although I will try to keep you a little bit shorter in your answers, otherwise we will not reach the four questions in all. But after this uh, first statement, uh, we zoom in. Because when we drafted the document um, on 11 chapters, we came to the conclusion, hey, there are many aspects uh, popping up in all of these research questions. So we call that the overarching themes. And they are listed here. It is the large scale that drives a lot of research. It is the multi-scale aspects. It is the need for big data analysis. The validation of knowledge, tools, and models. So a strong need for validation. And it is the need for an integrated approach and an overall design approach. So before, in the next question, we zoom in into the uh, research areas, we first like to discuss this one. Are these overarching uh, aspects really the barriers for further development? And what is the most urgent of these ones? Um, I gave, in the previous question, I made a nice order. Now it's open for all, because otherwise it's too static. So who wants to start? Matthias. Yeah. First of all, I liked your, the approach in, in your paper to describe major future trends in our industry and, and use this kind of as, as a kind of search field uh, for, for research topics. That was kind of a, um, a red line which was through the whole paper. Uh, very nicely. Out of your list of headlines, I would find the integrated approach as, as the most uh, urgent one, because the wind industry is a multidisciplinary industry, and that gives actually, a, to some extent, a structural disadvantage to, to the industry, because you need to follow many parallel tracks for a meaningful, meaningful success uh, on, on the system level. If, for example, you find a game-changing innovation for rotor blades, which reduce cost by 20%, this only reduces the cost of the, of the, of the turbine by 4 to 5%, or if you're offshore, it's even below 3%. Yeah. Yeah, so you have a major innovation for one major component, but, but the impact is for the system is relatively small. In some industry, like the computer industry, and that also goes to some extent for photovoltaics, you can focus the innovation much more on one single issue, Moore's law, yeah? reduce capacity or double capacity um, um, with a factor of two every year. So easy to communicate and much, and much easier target for the industry. And, and that is a challenge in our industry that we really need to integrate a lot of activities into one big result. So I, I, I agree that, that integration <coughs> is a key macro theme, if you will. But I think the larger integration question is integrating wind with the rest of the energy ecosystem. And by that I mean, you know, wind is 4%, 5% of the total production. But that production is almost always displacing some other capacity that's already on the grid. It's not incremental. It's what I call boutique energy, meaning it's nice to have, but it's not something that people rely on. And I think that in order for wind to, to go to the next um, to continue to grow the challenge of integrating wind with the rest of the grid, storage, distribution, these are the major challenges that I think the industry will, uh, will face. Cost will continue to come down, um, but it won't come down another order of magnitude like it has. It'll go to three and a half or three cents. But uh, the barrier to growth is gonna be 
how do you how do you generate power continuously with wind so that you can count on that capacity, yeah. not just displace coal or natural okay. gas? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> At the risk of being a little boring, I also noted down that you know integration is key. So those who integrate win, and I think that's true at you know all levels. I mean, certainly system integration for the you know greater sort of you know uh, power system, uh, but also uh, I mean you, you, from, from a research perspective, uh, I guess many will agree that magic often happens when disciplines sort of uh, blend together seamlessly. Um, but from a uh, the perspective of a uh, and OEM, it's obviously integrating the design of you know, subsystems, controls. From a developer perspective, it's you know, maybe more at a farm level. You also have to do layout optimization that is not just you know, sub-optimizing from, say, a wind resource or wake perspective, or, uh, mm. but also factor in uh, loads and uh, cost of uh, balance of, balance of plant. And from an operator perspective, uh, it's maybe more sort of at a fleet level, uh, how, to, uh, how to cope with the diversity in your fleet. I mean, how to integrate, uh, how to integrate different manufacturers' uh, machines. I mean, so it's a lot about standards, actually. I mean, so. Is this unanimous opinion that integrated approach is very important? Is that reflected to your educational and research programs? I think uh, as a research institution, we, we we need to seek even more long term because uh, we call ourselves wind energy and uh, we are set out to solve the energy problem but at the moment we are, so, we are solving basically a, a fraction of the electricity problem. We are not solving the energy problem. Electricity is just 25% maybe of the, of the energy consumption. So we really need to think about how can wind energy really use as energy source Heat, why not? Of course, people yeah. were tired of asking, what about the cost? You know, as a researcher, we need to put the side of the cost first and just to prove there's a physical feasibility to do that. And in that sense, the system approach is the right thing. We need to think wider in, in terms of system coupling between but the if, different... If I may interrupt, uh, Po, in, in the document, integrated approach also uh, wants to address uh, an integrated design of a wind farm, including all, all aspects. Integrated mm -hmm. design, including all uh, aspects at the North Sea, when we have a huge amount of wind energy, so cooperation with fishery and whatever you like to do. So it, are you busy in Stuttgart with these topics? The, um, not, 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 not necessarily fishery, but just <laughs> the, the thinking of an integrated approach. Yes, I mean, we, we certainly think uh, within the university, with the different department yeah. of those who are working on uh, energy storage, okay. on thermal energy storage, yeah. and, and how to do that. Yeah. Because as you said, uh, the, uh, the people are expecting reliable energy supply and not just green. Yeah. And, and that's our responsibility okay. to do that. Jim. Um, well, a lot of these uh, of, uh, are the challenges of today remind me of some of the challenges that uh, some of us uh, here in this room dealt with a number of years ago, namely with much smaller uh, power systems, wind diesel in particular, where, where, the, where the question was how to supply, say, 50% of your energy with wind turbines when you were dealing with diesels that had their own uh, particular characteristics, and sometimes it wasn't that easy, but th there was some, I think there was good experience there. Uh, but it did suggest that uh, going forward that uh, that, that means that th th to really do that effectively, not only the wind turbine designers have to consider um, their controls and operations, but at the same time, the, the designers of the other types of power plants, for example, gas turbines now are are, are certainly getting faster uh, at response than they were previously, and they make a, a good match uh, for, for wind turbines. Uh, if you look at some of the other, other loads, uh, uh, it sometimes it looks quite simple. For example, uh, seawater desalination looks like it ought to be pretty simple with reverse osmosis. But uh, if you want to, say, supply that all with wind, then the fluctuations of the wind uh, have to be taken into account in the behavior of uh, how these pumps work, yeah. for example. Just some examples like that. Yeah. Mm. So there's agreement that this is a really important topic. I'm glad to hear that because the successor in my function, as I will retire in a few months, he, has this, he or she will have this specific task for the integrated approach. So. 
thank you for the support of this uh, position. Uh, but at the same time, we have a problem because the integrated approach is the most difficult to explain to the audience, to your scientific bodies, because they think integrated approach is just linking this and that together. But it is, it is a scientific discipline uh, by its own. But that's not the topic for the discussion now. I'd like to proceed. Let me, let me just add to yeah, that, if I may, because I mean, an integrated approach helps. But the fact that the fact that wind has become so successful—it's yeah. a six billion dollar business for GE, yeah. comparable yeah. size for others. I mean, I think that fact alone drives the integration that you're talking yes. about, because yes, yes, yes. at that scale, people are looking for the best solution to reduce the cost of wind power through whatever means is necessary. So it's going to naturally drive the integration yes, yes, of yes. all those technologies to pick the one that's going to be the easiest way to reduce the cost or improve the reliability for whatever the problem is. And for that we are in a kind there's of more, what I'm position now. There's yeah. more demand for yes, the, I mean, it naturally yeah. the system will pull yeah. those technologies. Yeah. We go on to the next question. We make the step to the 11 R&D areas presented in the paper. There are many research challenges described. Each uh, research area has some two or three or four research challenges. And some may be easier solved than others. So what is the low-hanging fruit? What should we do first? And what are the most difficult nuts to crack? You push the button. Yeah. I push the button. I <laughs> yes. mean, but this is, this is a very tough question to answer in two okay. minutes. I mean, so uh, right, let's there's, as you said, there's a lot, you know. So, so you know, okay, one, uh, one, I think, sort of common thread that I, that I see, I mean, also listening to the talks here yesterday, is that there are sort of, there's sort of two schools of what we do, I mean, in the, and this applies in the, both in aerodynamics and in structures and control, etc. Um, there's the people that like to do physical models sort of from the ground up, you know, uh, science the hell out of, uh, you know, the problems. And then there's the people that just look at data. You have mentioned big data on the previous, yeah. uh, so it's just a black box, I mean, and I think neither, neither approach will fully take us there, I mean. So we obviously need to leverage the data that is there and we need the physical models, that's not what I'm saying, I mean. What we need is a sort of a middle ground, I mean. Where we, uh, where we have model frameworks that are, you know, uh, for operations that are, you know, learning basically from the observations made. I mean, so uh, uh, there's a lot of examples of that here yesterday. I was glad to see. I mean, so I'm talking about, you know, observer models, digital twins, clones, whatever people call it. I mean, yeah. for load, fatigue, lifetime estimation. I mean, and I think, you know, there's a couple of things happening in in the sort of greater you know, technology landscape that is, that is helping that, I mean, this is whole, uh, yeah, my buzzword, Internet of Things uh, revolution. So sensors become really inexpensive, I mean. So what could we actually do if we you know, had, you know, sensors for free, I mean? If we, if we sort of thought, of thought of it that way, I mean, what, what would we do, I mean? But it's also a place where there's sort of a schism between industry and academia, because typically industry sits on all the data and academia are more sort of, you know, modeling things, right? That is, so that maybe because they don't have access to the data. <laughs> you give a nice uh, bridge to the next question, so I will keep this in mind because that comes back. Matthias. Yeah, but I, I, to, to some extent, I have a little bit of a problem with your question because if we are talking about fundamental research with long-term but potentially heavy impact, we yeah. should be talking about different to crack nuts only and also hope for some unexpected discovery with high potential for the industries, which you always find if you're doing deep dive research. So in this context, I have a problem with the term low hanging fruits in the sense of low effort and high impact. The, the trouble is that at the beginning of an innovation funnel, you simply don't know what is going to be successful and what is going to be disappointing. And I think it is very important if if we are talking, talking about long-term research, that we have the courage to actually attack all the points which, which you mentioned there. I think yeah. it is, um, wind research should not only, as we discussed in the, um, in, in the, um, for the question earlier, uh, should not only look at the, the wind turbine as a total system, but really have the, the courage to really deep dive into all the specifics, this long list of specifics you have in, in, your, in your paper, because today we simply don't know what out of this list is really providing a game-changing innovation and, and is reducing cost for our, for yeah. our products. Yeah. <clears throat> Some other views on nuts to crack priority. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I agree a certain extent that we 
uh, if you look at low hanging fruit, you think this is something that's just singing, falling on your head, and you just pick it up and uh, you <laughs> reduce the cost by one cent. Well, that doesn't exist, of course. Um, but one of the, I think, the, the main challenge of defining long term research is I, I remember I, we have this uh, uh, picture of the aircraft design course where every department of the aircraft designer uh, say this is the most important focus you need to do. The maintenance people want to have all kind of facility to get it as easily maintained as possible. The manufacturer people say it should be made of wood whatsoever. And uh, so there are a lot of um, uh, conflicting interest is on the, in the eye of the beholder. Wh what is the most important target? But one thing I, my personal opinion is, uh, is uh, wind energy is about wind. And the more I, I know about the wind turbine, the less I know about the wind. Because wind is a, actually the thing, the phenomena that is causing all the, the good things and the bad things in the wind turbine. And, and we still don't know really much about wind. It's, and we are really focusing more, much more on the turbine than on the wind as a phenomenon phenomena itself. I think the physicists in the room will like my answer, I guess. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> they will have that chance in 50 minutes from now. Jim. Um, well, as, as, uh, specifically in answer to this question, I guess that maybe the low-hanging fruit is is uh, to kind of continue on the, on the path of step-by-step uh, -step improvements, uh, I think which we've done a lot of in the last few years, and maybe the harder, harder thing is to do something uh, more unusual. Uh, for example, uh, we heard from uh, Bob Th uh, Thresher last night about, about uh, experience with two-bladed rotors, uh, vertical access machines, and you know, a lot of people just say, well, those are just too hard or they're just not worth it. We shouldn't go there anymore. Uh, you know, but maybe we should, or at least we should not be afraid to go there. But because we have these three-bladed upwind rotors that always work, uh, it's, of course, hard to, to, to jump into the unknown like that. But I think that uh, it's worth looking at. And, and there may be some other, maybe somewhat more outlandish designs that should at least be considered, but maybe people are even less likely to do that as well. But it's still kind of, you can learn a lot, as Bob said, by making mistakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the good thing of research, it's done by researchers, and one of the most uh, important arguments to have success is the passion of a researcher. So most researchers do not care so much about priority in research, they follow their own passion. And, I think that's very good. But then it's up to industry to balance that with priorities. And that is the next question. Because here I state long-term research by academics is nice, but researchers do not build wind turbines. We just don't do that. On the other hand, sometimes the industry asks too early in the research process, what is the expected impact on the cost of energy? Because that question can kill every new research when you ask the question too early. So we have to find a way to match these two different points of view. The long-term research has to be connected to the shorter-term research and industry. And how to do so, and how to make the academics and the industry benefits from this process. And I guess that is a, a, a tough question to do. We have seen many co in my own country many corporations in industry. We are always able to find an area of research where we feel both comfortable in. It's always a difficult task to find that specific window of research. What is your opinion? Uh, How to match the bridge? So I would, I would answer that maybe first. I would say perhaps GE has kind of a fundamental advantage yep. there because yep. we do the research and we do the applied yep. industrial, yep. industrial side of it within the same company. So we have a spectrum of of, of research activities, um, yeah. some very fundamental aerodynamics, for instance, right here in our in our Munich Research Center yeah. on this campus, we do fantastic aerodynamic research, which is applicable across all of our across all of our uh, our businesses. A certain fraction of that we know is going to be long term and unsuccessful, and we accept that. And a certain fraction is very short term, sponsored by the businesses, which is more likely to be successful. So we kind of have a spectrum of research activity, but but I think all of it relates you know, fundamentally to the, to the needs of the research and the needs of the customer. 
maybe I would like to, to return your question with two somewhat provocative questions. I'm, I mean, how much connection does it actually need for a very, for a very deep dive into a specific and initially very academic topic? And second, uh, if in your field of excellence you have worked out a great piece of technology or innovation or know-how, would you then be afraid of the industry not being interested in that? So, so one of my clients is a startup which at this university has developed a great piece of um, fiber optical technology on a purely academical level and only then discovered that this is interesting for the wind industry and by now has developed a product and a great resonance in the industry. So, but let, let, Let's take up your first question. So you ask, why does the long-term research people need to be connected to industry? Yeah, because, uh, uh, yeah. yeah just, please, uh, can you say something about that? Why do we need industry in long-term research? Why do we need to be in contact with the industry when we like to do our long-term research? If I got that straight, I fortunately have a hearing aid and I don't always uh, understand what's okay. going on there. But, um, so I think you still have to repeat exactly what, it, what the question is. Uh, Matthias replied to this question about connection of uh, in academics and industry. He said, when it is about long-term research, just do your job. Why do you need uh, the interaction with the industry? That's my translation of your uh, question. I have personally some answers, but I'd like to hear your answer. Well, you certainly, yeah, I mean, you certainly obviously need uh, some interaction with indus industry to make sure that you're not just c c completely in left field somewhere. Um, and, and there are, are, there are certainly uh, multiple ways to do that uh, in forums uh, such as this. Uh, you, can, uh, you can have these kind of interactions. Um, but it did occur to me one er way that kind of is from, uh, from the academic side of things that, that makes it easier to work with industry is when uh, uh, data from experimental projects or real projects uh, uh, is made available. And I, I understand there's all these IP issues are, are, are regarding data, but uh, to the extent that you can create ways that the data is kind of blinded or blindsided, or yeah. maybe it's the wrong word, but uh, is, is prevented from you know, being sort of directly associated with specific projects, but the data can be used for, say, validating models. That's extremely useful. Academics love that. Without data, we're kind of, uh, kind of, kind of useless. So uh, yep. that specific way to figure out how to share data would be yep. tremendously useful. So, sides. Matthias, the answer is data. Pardon me? The answer is data. Yes, I mean, there are certainly areas where you need data, and I, I think where it is also makes sense that the research community, maybe together with the industry, uh, has some, some generic models, and that actually exists in the research community, so, so that you have this generic wind turbine and actually pretty useful data. So I agree, there is, uh, for, some, for some areas you need, of course, a closer link into the industry, but not necessarily for all the research areas which are relevant for the industry. That's fair. I fair. actually think yeah. that the problem is maybe not the link between research and, and, and the industry in terms of working together. It is more the, the link, uh, it is more the missing appreciation support from funding organizations for supporting this deep yeah. dive research. And, and I think the, the key question is maybe more how could the industry and the research community uh, join forces to, to, um, to um, make the funding organizations and the politicians understand that, yes, we need yeah. subsidies and money for yeah. these deep dives in, in specific topics. Yeah. <coughs> I will give the floor to uh, the other two, and then we pass to the audience. Yeah. Then, uh, <clears throat> I, I think maybe, you know, in this discussion, I mean, we need to, defer, to define a little bit what you mean by long term. I mean, I'm not sure it's quite clear actually in here. I mean, because I mean, and certainly with Matthias, if we talk about, you know, say fundamental research. I mean, there's no, uh, there's no particular need to, for industry to, you know, prioritize, help prioritize that. I mean, yeah. so the, it's a spectrum, right? I mean, and to obviously as we come to also the more applied spectrum of that, I mean, industry involvement would be a, a requirement. I, I think we can all agree. Yeah. yeah, I would simply add that a certain fraction of research needs to be um, 
fundamental and long-term and unstructured, but it needs to be a fraction of the research. It can't be all of the research. And whatever research is done needs to tie back eventually to you know, some potential application. Could be distant, could be long-term, but that link has to be at least envisioned. But you offered a nice answer to this question. All industries have to become that large as GE and open a research center, and then we can do the job. <laughs> no, that is a joke. With this, uh, we go to the audience, because we have some 17 minutes left. I guess there will be questions to us concerning the questions displayed on the screen. You may deviate from that uh, too. Uh, there are two uh, mics uh, we see there, uh, Stefan. Right. I would like to comment on that is with the funding agency. So there's only so much money the European Commission or other countries have. And we learned yesterday there's plenty of money or has been plenty of money in the US to finance the R&D. Then there's a new president and the money vanished. Same is going on now in Denmark. So it's up and down and up and down. Um, in the past, the European Commission has been focusing on demonstration demonstration projects, large DRL levels. Now they're thinking a bit different. So should we jointly then, taking up the, the comment from Matthias Schubert, should we jointly then try to convince them there's only a, a little amount of money available. Don't spend it on big demonstration projects because in a 1 billion euro project it makes no difference if you get 4 million euro funding or not. Let's try to convince them, put that money on a low DRL level. There you can have an impact with high risk. But this question is for whom? For all of you. <laughs> I'm actually not talking about and or, or I'm not talking about uh, should we make a choice. I think at least in Germany I know the reality is that the research money is really uh, purely given for applied research. So, so, so the public money is really dedicated, I mean it's organized by the Ministry of, Re of, of Economics and so the funds which are available for wind energy are purely dedicated to applied research. And we have a lot of organizations in Germany, like Max Planck DFG, who don't really have wind energy and, and the research around wind energy on their radar. So I'm talking about different resources of money which we have to attack to also make possible in this industry to do fundamental research. Yeah. So, so this audience might not want to hear this, but I think that the, the best research money that can be spent right now is in the area of storage and integration for wind, not just incremental improvements in technologies. And I don't mean that to be dismissive of the importance of incremental improvement in the technologies. But if the question is, how do we grow wind the fastest and make it displace more current options, I think that's where the research has got to be, demonstration projects around how do you store wind power and, uh, and use it later? Yeah, and with a little bit more general point of view, I would like to say that uh, we have been uh, um, pleased by many uh, research programs uh, offered by the European Commission dedicated to wind energy or to renewable energy. But when we talk about long-term research, we have to take up the challenge that we forget about these preferred calls and simply go, yeah, what is simply, to the scientific funds. So compete with the classical sciences. We are there too, we go to for ERC funds, we go to our national funding agencies to ask money that does not have the stamp of wind energy a priori. When we talk about long-term research, we have to make that step, get out of this comfort zone of prioritized uh, money. But that's, I saw the hand of uh, Joachim. Yeah. And then we move to some of that. I have a bit basic yeah. question. So I think everybody agrees we need basic research. This is clear for making progress. But now we start, especially in academia, we think we need basic research motivated, defined on the background of wind energy. And this is in particular a question to the industry. Do you need, is there a value added effect if we focus on our basic research on the problems on wind energy or taking problems from the wind energy, or would it better to stay like it is? We have a lot of basic research, and if you need an expert, okay, from turbulence, you just take one who knows very well turbulence, that's my field, or is it, well, it's an added value if you have these persons 
already doing basic research with respect to the problems, intrinsic problems of wind energy. Was Joachim, I think the, the, the question was whether um, the basic research needs to be focused on wind or it could be, I mean, uh, yeah, okay, I mean, so, so I think, you know, uh, well, basic research is basic research, so I think it's a little bit uh, disconnected from the application in some sense, I mean. So, uh, but the, the challenge is, of course, I mean, to, to make the argument that how, how does this food chain work, I mean, from the basic re research to the more applied, I mean, uh, and at the end of that stands industry, perhaps, I mean. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 um, I'm a little with with uh, James there that you know you need to have you know both basic and applied research. I mean, but you know in uh, I think the problem is a little bit that the people that are making the calls on 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 funding. I mean, there is this trend that everything has to be very very applied, very entrepreneurial. I mean, you actually see it even below university level, even in upper primary schools these days. I mean. So kids are asked to be multidisciplinary without mastering the disciplines, which is which is actually not that easy. I mean, how? Can, so, mm -hmm. all right. There were, uh, um, first there, and then it will be you. One moment. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, just on first question, I see that uh, from 30 kilowatt to uh, 8 megawatt. It took around uh, 30 years, and as an engineer, if I simply extrapolate in next 30 years, it could be 8,000 megawatt. So my, I, I, right now it seems quite impossible to me. So my two questions, uh, one is that uh, when do you think and at what power rating you think it is going to be matured? And second question, um, uh, in what way you think uh, we should uh, do research? Uh, like to have 8 megawatt for infinite time of operation or 8,000 megawatt for just few years. Thank you. Well, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question for sure. If, if the question is how large will wind turbines eventually get, I think my, my opinion is on the 10 megawatt kind of range. I think larger than that, probably best to split the thing. And the, and the cost curve for dollars per swept area, even with new technologies coming online for for blades modular and, and such things. Um, my, my opinion is that's, that's kind of where that will go. Can uh, people on the panel um, try to cover what they felt was the most important innovation that they've seen, in, most important innovation in wind industry that they've seen in the past? And can this been tied to an intentional research project or agenda? <laughs> Nice question. Well, I had that question on another panel, actually, a similar question on an aircraft engine panel some time ago. And the question was, you know, how much will aviation change in the next 50 years? And my answer to that was, aviation hasn't changed at all in the last 50 years. Why would it change in the next 50 years? And by that, I mean it's still an aluminum tube with two engines under each wing. And so if you look at our wind turbine technology today, it's not significantly different than the wind turbine technology a generation or two generations ago. There's been incremental advancements in almost every area of the turbine. It hasn't been like a, ra a remarkable transfiguration or completely different configuration for wind turbine. It's not, by that I mean, I don't think you can point to one single innovation and say this is the thing that enabled the cost of wind turbines to drop by an order of magnitude. It's been an integrated approach across all of the technologies. Okay. If they may, con I'm, I totally agree with you, but it seems like these panels there's this, oh, we must, in, and the funding agencies, we must find innovation. We have to innovate. We have to have these game changers. There is no game changer. Is that right? Or is it, is it all incremental? So can you tell me, was there some major, major was there an example of a game changer? It's, it's incremental with different emphasis at different times. For instance, in the last several years, I think controls has been an area where there's been remarkable innovation which has allowed larger rotors to be placed on towers without changing the loads on the towers. So I would say there's been remarkable innovation in that particular area in the last several years and something else will be the focus in the future. But I saw well, like basic... No, no, may, may I continue? Thank you. I see a hand there already for some time. Yeah. So my, my question 
um, to frame it, I, I need to put one slide, which was the one that had all the, all the elements that the panel was going to consider that one. So if I look at that, that bullet list is similar to many other areas. For example, the smart grid. Same list of bullets, different problem. And I pick the smart grid because it's related to integration and storage. One of the things that has helped mature areas reinvent themselves is the identifications of breakthrough that give food to others to bring their thoughts to the table. For example, in the smart grid, transmission and power systems was very mature in the US until someone started talking about the smart grid, which in integrates communications control and, and devices in very clever ways. That created a tremendous influx of people and funding at the fundamental level to work in that area. Similarly, photovoltaics. The, the breakthrough there is nanotechnology. There is more money in the U.S. going to... Can you, I'll, I'll phrase the question. Yeah. So my question is, rather than low-hanging fruits, what are the breakthroughs that people can get their arms around in order to bring new things to the wind energy industry or the research? So breakthroughs. Um, my personal answer is that this was exactly the question why the Academy started this discussion. What are the breakthroughs that we like to achieve to make uh, a faster progress of wind energy uh, possible? Uh, and that resulted in a book. So there's not one single breakthrough, but if you talk about uh, grids, maybe because that was your example, maybe someone in the panel can say something about that. Breakthroughs in grid issues. For when? Um, maybe a little bit general formulated. I think uh, wind energy, just like any um, technology development, as well as the research, is, uh, is simply shaped by event and uh, history. Because when we are talking about uh, 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 long-term research need, it is shaped by the concept development that we have uh, lived through in the last 30 years. What there is a lot of if scenario. If, if let's say, the two-bladed machine has, for some reason, became the standard concept, downwind two-bladed machine has became the standard concept for some reason, we will be talking probably about very different research needs here than if we are talking about the current three-bladed machine. Right? There's so much to say about all these questions, but still I go to the next question, and there's a hand there on top. Yeah, please do. Hello. Uh, there was a couple of times now the question, where are the breakthroughs? And I'm working on airborne wind energy, and this is a potential uh, ch game changer, which could make it possible to build wind energy systems with just 10% of the mass and material use. It could be possible to use on floating platforms without any bending moments or very low bending moments. And so my question is, how can we get funding for this type of applied research? I know there is a funding from the European Union for theoretical research. Uh, but for example, I was told from Fraunhofer Institute, well, we cannot uh, do any research on urban wind because we need 50% co-funding from the industry. But uh, there is only very, very small urban wind energy uh, industry yet, and they don't have very much uh, money. So uh, what would be your answer to this question? Before giving the floor to someone, I should say that in the preparation of this debate, we decided not to talk about funding, because then you enter into many, many other types of questions. So I would like to rephrase a little bit your question. Uh, uh, how do we look upon this uh, new kit on the block, airborne wind energy, and what is the potential future of that? Does the classical wind turbine industry have an opinion about this new kit on the block? <laughs> no one dares to take the button. <laughs> I, I would dare to answer, but <laughs> I, I think, uh, as uh, I mean, Bob yesterday said, as the industry mature, just like a child, they take less and less risk because you have more things to lose if you start changing your concept. And that's 
I think what is so difficult to make a disrupting technology into the mainstream because the, uh, the, the threshold to enter the industry is so high. 20 years ago, you can start your company on wind energy on the garage. But uh, this day, the threshold is so high that anything that is a disrupting technology has a very tough time to, to enter the, the, um, the industry. And I think that's also something we need to think about in terms of uh, research. Maybe we should stop thinking about basic or, or uh, lo uh, apply long-term, short-term. We should talk maybe about low-risk research and high-risk research. There should be a, a way to fund high-risk research that has high reward but high risk, right? With this, I think it is a nice moment to close the discussion because it's 10 o'clock. Yeah, I see some of you want to push buttons and there may be questions in the audience, but we have to come to an end. Um, as you have witnessed, the discussion does not deliver uh, clear, unique answers that uh, solve all problems, but that's never to be expected. So I'm personally very glad with the discussion. Uh, please stay uh, seated uh, for a while. Please stay seated. Uh, James, you want to say something? I just want to say thank you. I thought you were going to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, with this, I think we can close this uh, uh, session. Joachim? Oh, yes, I forgot that. Uh, at the webpage of the European Academy for Wind Energy, if you push somewhere a button, research, and then some, at some moment uh, you find uh, this. And we have a webpage opened for discussion. So all questions that you were not able to pose now here, you can pose there, and we will organize that people answer it. And all in all, that should lead to, uh, I hope, a vivid discussion so we can update the document, not every year because it's long-term research, but in five years from now. Thank you. Thank you very much.